Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Java C8 for Java e developer session. So it's great to see many faces in the morning. I mean, we guess that there are many faces because we don't see uh, your faces. But anyway, so the agenda for today, we'll talk about Java C8 in a Java e context. Why? Well, Java C8 has been released last year in April, so uh, about 18 months ago. Um, on the other hand, we have Java E, Java E7. That's the current version of the specification. So there are many application server out there that are Java E7 compliant. Glassfish, Wildfly, and so on. If you look at those application server, most of them are certified on Java AC8. Uh, and in, in fact, some of them are only certified on Java AC8. If you take Glassfish, the latest release, it only runs on top of Java AC8. Same is true for Wildfly 10. Java C8 only. White, uh, WebLogic as well. So the latest version of WebLogic is Java C8 only. I'm not sure about uh, IBM Liberty Profile. I couldn't find the details. But anyway, uh, that means that today you have a Java e application server that is running on top of uh, Java C8. So today we are going to check some of the Java C8 features uh, in a Java e context. How you can use some of those features because you have the choice. Either you use uh, pure Java E7 without any Java SC8 capabilities, or it might be a good idea to start to use some of the Java SC8 capabilities. And also, you have to keep in mind that Java SC8, Java SC7, sorry, has been end of flight this year. So you really want to be on Java SC8 today. So my name is David Delabasse. I work at Oracle in the Cloud Application Foundation. Uh, in our group, we deal with Java E, the technology. Um, Glassfish, the Java reference implementation, and WebLogic, our commercial supported product. And my name is Jose. I work in the Paris area as an assistant professor at the university there. I also work as an uh, independent contractor. Uh, I've got quite some resources online, just as you, by the way. <laughs> you have many resources online on the Java magazine, on a site called Pluralsight, which is a training site. Uh, US based, also on Microsoft Virtual Academy. I made a Java EE course for Microsoft Virtual Academy and uh, on Parlays for still some time. Well, I think we can start. <laughs> okay, so before we start, some logistics. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm an Oracle employee. <laughs> you did not. <laughs> so this is the standard Sefer Burst statement slide. So the basic idea is that you shouldn't make any purchase decision based on what I will say today. Having said that, I will not talk about products, <coughs> so there is nothing to buy. Does it so mean that all, all we are going to say is just bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> Next disclaimer. <laughs> right. Ah, yes. Uh, despite my French accent, <laughs> I'm not French. I'm from Belgium. And despite my Belgian accent, I'm French. So, yes, about the, if you have any questions, we have a nice, uh, it's not a PC, it's a Mac, by the way, we, which, which uh, look at this uh, ash slide on Twitter, so you can uh, use Twitter if you, if you wish to ask questions. It's quite hard to hear everybody in those big rooms, so you can use Twitter, it's, it's sometimes more handy. There is also the, the, the DevOps application to ask questions, but I understand that once the talk is over, the questions uh, are not um, accessible anymore. Uh, there, there is some kind of delay after, after the talk where, where they got uh, hidden. Okay, so, so anyway, since we don't know how to use Lido, so if you have any question, uh, yeah. use the Twitter handle. Yes, that please. Works better. Yeah, that, that's really great. The, the first part of the Java C API we're going to talk about is the date uh, API. Uh, maybe some of you already use the Jada Time API as a, as a third party uh, API to handle date and time and calendar if you're not too happy with the Java Util date or Java Util calendar class. Now, the good news is in Java SE8, thanks to the work of Stephen Colborne, the Jada Time date and time API has been ported to Java SE8. So if you're used to that, now you can use it. Uh, we're not going through all this API because it's really a big API. There are many, many patterns and concepts in it. It's really worth checking, and the Javadoc and documentation of it has really been extremely well written and very precisely and carefully written, so please go and check it. Just to give you a, a little taste of what you can do, uh, there is a, a special support for um, time zones in the, in the date and time API. You can get all the time zones with just this method, zone ID, get available zone ID. So if you want to get the time zone associated to Paris, 
you just do write this kind of thing. From the time zone, you can create a special <coughs> zone date time. A date time is a, is a regular uh, date time, as, as, you, as you can guess. And you can associate this date time, which is in fact a point on the timeline that is independent of any kind of time zone, to a special time zone to convert this point of the timeline in the time zone you're in. And this leads to this kind of pattern. So basically this, this date, by the way, is the date where our France uh, won the, the soccer World Cup. That was <coughs> a long time ago. Yes, that was a long time ago. So stop it, please. <laughs> You're annoying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so and, and hopefully uh, four years later it was the other uh, World Cup where well, France did not participate, I think. Oh, yes, it did, but it didn't score anything. <laughs> they went on strike? Or? <laughs> I can't remember. No, no, this is a bad souvenir. All right, so you can just, you, you have some kind of arithmetic between those, those, those zones, the day time, so you can just add, for instance, period <coughs> of your fall. This period object is also an object from the date and time API to handle uh, periods of times between uh, date time. And you have those factory methods, very handy to compute this one. Now, if you want to uh, express this zone, the date time, in another zone ID, you have this very handy method with zone same instant. So same instant means it's the same instant of this absolute timeline, but expressed in different time zones. So if you want to do some conversion from one time zone to another, you just have to, to call this method, which is very handy. So you don't have to, uh, to hack again with this calendar uh, class, which is quite hard and, uh, and very error prone. Uh, many, many use cases have been implemented in the date and time API um, for us, for, for our applications which is very nice. I also added the, uh, the patterns to go from the Java util date to the, the other elements of the uh, date and time API. So those are just, uh, just here. So if you have legacy code based on Java util date, you can just convert all your calls to this new uh, date and time API. And of course, uh, it wouldn't make any sense if JPA was not supporting that for Java EE uh, developer. Yeah, which is so, basically the case. <coughs> Next question: How you can use that new date and time API in Java? E? So right now, GPA GPA 2.1 doesn't support uh, that API. I mean, GPA 2.1 was released one year before Java C8 was released, so it makes sense. Nevertheless, there are uh, techniques that you can use to add support for that new uh, date and time API, and that is using the um, attribute converter that has been introduced in GPA 2.1. So the idea is very simple. So you can use an attribute converter basically to do the conversion between uh, a specific type to the type that will be persisted to the database. So how it works, this is an example. So we have a very basic entity. Uh, we have just one field, uh, instance, which should be called really instant, but its type is uh, instant. We are using the annotation add convert to uh, specify that uh, we, should, we want to use an entity converter. We specify the class of that converter. This is a converter, so it's basically an implementation of attribute convert. It works on two types. Um, the type uh, that we have in our uh, entity and the actual type that will be persisted to the database. And obviously, we have to provide uh, the method to do the conversion between those types. So whenever we write to the database and whenever we read to the database. And that's the meaning of those two methods. So convert to database columns and convert to entity attribute. So you see that it's fairly easy uh, to do. Something else that we can use, we can just use strings. Uh, for example, if we want to persist that new uh, zone date time uh, type, we can convert that to a, stream, to a string. So whenever it will be persisted, it will be persisted as a, streams, as a string. Sorry. And whenever we read it back, the strings will be converted back to that uh, new Java AC8 uh, type. Uh, one remark about converter. So converter, uh, you can decide to apply a converter to a specific attribute, or you can also specify that you want all attributes of that specific type to be automatically converted. So you have some level of granularity there. So right now, uh, in GPA 2.1, we can use the new date and type API, uh, either by doing conversion um, to the date, to the temporal type that is supported by uh, GPA 2.1, or just by doing a conversion uh, to, string, so to strings. One quick remark. So, uh, so today, we have GPA 2.1. 
This is one of the things that will be fixed in GPA 2.2. So supporting natively the new uh, SE8 that in time API is something that we should see in the next version of uh, GPA. What about GSF? Uh, it makes sense to also support that new date in type API uh, in GSF. And basically the approach would be the same. So uh, we would use custom converter to do that. So this is an example. So uh, we just need to implement that uh, face convert converter uh, interface. We have two methods in there. The first one um, gets the, um, so basically, whenever you, 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 you represent something in the browser, it's obviously represented as a string. So you need, a con you need to do the conversion basically between the string and the, that uh, date and time uh, type. That's what we do here. So get as object, it get a string, and it return uh, instant type in this case. And obviously, we also need to provide the implementation the other way around. So get a string, so we get that uh, new uh, date and time type, and we do the conversion to return that as a strings. And obviously, I need to use my uh, new converter <coughs> in my GSF application. So that's what I'm doing here, for example, on an input text. And what I will ha have at the end of the day in my model, so in my bins, is obviously that new uh, SE8 date and time type. Right. Would it be supported in the upcoming version of JSF natively? I mean, um, I haven't checked, but I guess so because one of the things that uh, that we are doing for Java E8, uh, so Java E8 will only run on top of Java AC8. So uh, the idea is that whenever we do an update to uh, an uh, API in Java E for Java E8, we have to look if it makes sense to support some of the new AC8 capabilities. So in that case, it would make sense as okay. well. Hmm, fine, nice. I love it. Um, let us talk about annotations. I heard that Java Hihi was quite heavily relying on XML descriptors years ago, and now it relies heavily on annotations now, right? Okay. There are new things in annotation from Java 8 uh, to Java, uh, sorry, sorry, from Java 7 to Java 8. Basically, if I have a JPA entity and I want to uh, declare name queries <coughs> On, uh, on this entity, I need to wrap those named query one by one in a, some kind of wrapping annotation called name queries, uh, plural. Uh, I could also write them in an XML stuff, by the way, but we can also do, do that with annotations. Why do I have to, uh, to wrap this in a, in a wrapping annotation? Just because I cannot put twice the same annotation on any element in uh, Java SE. It is not allowed. It is forbidden by the, by the compiler, by the way. If you try to do that, you will have a compiler uh, error. Now, in Java 8, there is a modification to that, and we can indeed write this kind of code. That is, repeating the same annotation more than once on any kind of element in a Java SC um, a code in any kind of Java AC code. We are going to see how it works, but let us see first uh, some example. Maybe you can show us some example. So this is a pure Java E7 code. Uh, so this is basically a bin validation. So in this case, uh, we are doing a validation. So whenever we want to order a car, we pass the, that car object. And we, has, we are using this uh, check car uh, validator to make sure that we can order uh, that car. So to do that, again, this is pure Java uh, EE7. I need to write the check car annotation. So it's a custom validator. So uh, I declare the annotation. I I'm using the add constraint annotation to specify what is uh, my, uh, my actual uh, constraint validator. So it will be car validator. And the rest is just uh, as, you would do, as, as you are doing, in fact, today uh, with bin validation. So there's nothing new there. And this is the implementation of uh, my uh, constraint validator. So it's, a, it's an implementation of the constraint validator interface. Um, there are just two methods in there. The initialize, initialize method uh, that basically allows us to get uh, the value that is being passed to the uh, annotation. So in the example, it would be uh, Volkswagen, the VW, well, Volkswagen. <laughs> and then there's a second method, is valid, which does the actual validations. So either it's valid or it's not. So it just returns a Boolean. And in this example, I'm just doing a stupid validation based on the brand of the car. Nothing fancy there. Now, if we want to make that annotation repeatable um, in using Java AC8, uh, we would have to do uh, the following. So it's basically the same 
um, annotation. The only thing, the only difference is that I'm using the attributable annotation. And I'm specifying there the check cars, which is basically a container for the repeated annotations. The rest is pure uh, Java SC, Java EE7 code. Nothing new there. Now, if we check uh, well, we also need to define the, the, that uh, check cars, which is basically just an array for the check car annotation. So it's fairly easy to implement. There's nothing to do there. It's just an array for that uh, annotation. Yes, uh, in fact, this trick is used by the compiler. That is, the compiler knows that the check car annotation should be wrapped in a check cars, so it will add the check cars annotation itself. Yep. This is how it works in Java C. Once we have done that, uh, we can do that. So now we. Whenever we order a car, we want to make, well, we want to do a validation. Is it a Volkswagen? Is it an Audi? So we can do those kind of tricks now uh, using Java E7 on top of uh, Java AC8. That's nice. So your car is, should be at the same time a Volkswagen and an Audi? No, it can't are, be. Are, are well, you talking about this uh, validation stuff people are using for well, it, pollution it, measurement? So, yeah, so it can't, it can't be a Volkswagen, it can't be an Audi, it can't be a Skoda, it can't be a Porsche, and so on. Ah, great. <laughs> So the air will be purer with this kind of bin validation stuff. <laughs> All right, there is another trick that we can do with the annotation in Java SE 8, is that we can put annotations on types, which was not possible in Java, in Java SE 7. So we can, for instance, if we decide that this list of people uh, should not be nil, we can add this non-nil method annotation on it, and some kind of other stuff should check for this uh, field or for this variable, whatever. Um, so that it, it, it is not nil, and I can also put that on the type parameter of this uh, of this list to check that I should not be able to put any nil values in a list. Now, putting nil values in a list uh, is is not the greatest pattern of all. I uh, don't think you should be doing that. And uh, we heard uh, yesterday that in Java SE 9 we will have new kinds of uh, patterns to create lists, uh, sets, and maps, and those patterns will forbid to put nil values. Uh, in list, so making this kind of pattern quite uh, well, not that useful, in fact. All right, so this was for type annotation, and we don't see the questions anymore, so maybe we could uh, yeah. try to do something. Right, let us have a look at the string class. Now, the string class is, is a quite a useful class. I never, I never saw any application that does not use uh, any strings in it, by the way. Uh, th there is essentially one thing I would like to point out in the string class and in the th string field. Oh, this is picture time, David. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thank it's you. not stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, people. We're just alone with this. Fine lady. <laughs> right. So, um, how do you do? How how do we do? How how have we been doing to join strings in our applications? Basically, most of the time, you take your string builder since Java 5, all right, string buffer before that. We just keep adding, appending, appending, appending stuff with it, with a separator, for instance. And of course, at the end of the day, there's one separator that is too much, so you, you need to get rid of it once your string buffer or string builder has been built, and then call the toString method on it. And this little ugly piece of code, of course, is copy-pasted everywhere, because everywhere we need to join strings to build bigger strings with a separator, and even sometimes with a postfix and a prefix. Now, the nice thing is that we have an API for that in Java SE 8, which comes in the string joiner class. You can build, yes, I hear yes, <laughs> this is great. We, we could have seen this kind of addition to the JDK years ago, but hey, it just happened in Java 8. So you just create a string joiner on this separator. We have a builder pattern, add, 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 blah, blah, blah. And then we call the two string method, and it just works as expected. It, of course, handles all <coughs> the corner cases you can, you can imagine. That is, if I have no element, if I have only one element, etc., without uh, repeating this ugly code once again. And if I want to add a prefix and a postfix to this string joiner, it's very easy. Just add more arguments to the construction of this string joiner, and it will work once again as expected. If I have no argument, I will have the, the opening and closing curly braces, and if I have only one argument, of course, I will not have the, um, the separator, which is very nice. It's a real time saver with no problem. I have another pattern for that. Uh, inside the string class itself, 
in the form of the, of the static method, uh, join method. Uh, the join method, I just pass the separator, then a var arg of all the elements I want to join, uh, and I just print out the result, and it will work once again as expected. So it's even simpler. The, the, the only uh, difference between the string joiner and this join factory method is that I cannot pass a prefix and a postfix to the join method. So if I need to do that, I need to fall back on the string joiner uh, element. Now, this works on uh, arrays, since it works well on arrays since this is a, a varag. Now, if I have my element on a list, uh, the, the simplest pattern is not this one, it's to create a stream. We are going to talk a little more about streams uh, later in this talk. Basically, you open a stream on, on your list uh, of strings, uh, and then just apply this very simple pattern, collect collectors the joining. This collect method takes a collector as a parameter. Uh, we are going to see other examples of, uh, of collectors. And this collectors the joining with the separator <coughs> as an argument will just work uh, as expected uh, once again. So if you have a list or something that can be turned into a list, this is the simplest pattern and more efficient pattern to use. And by the way, this collectors dot joining a collector also takes a prefix and a postfix, so you can also create uh, strings by joining elements uh, using this pattern. This is great. I love this one. And this is super convenient whenever, uh, for example, you have to build a mm. path, for example. Yeah. I mean, that's something that we do all the time. Absolutely. Well, to build paths, I have another pattern with the path interface yeah. that, takes, uh, that takes all the elements of the path and will join them in a, in a, in a given path. Now, you, you've probably heard about parallel streams. You can really completely mess up this stuff by using parallel stream, which is very nice also. If you call parallel streams, since you cannot uh, uh, tell in advance in what order your elements are going to be processed, it can completely mix up the string that you're going to use. No, this was a joke. Don't use parallel stream with this kind of pattern. It's, uh, <laughs> it's so really anyway, we have a disclaimer, of, a third dis disclaimer for parallel strings. Yes, strings, absolutely. So and, and we have this safe harbor statement. Yeah, yeah, don't well. listen to what we are so. saying. <laughs> Just don't do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think this, the, the, the next slide is yours. No, that was mine. I was supposed to do the strings. Were you? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so I'm the next sorry. slide is still yours. I'm not going to do the next one. <laughs> sorry. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah, I'm doing the old stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so finally... But this is not old stuff. Uh, well, we have now in the platform uh, Base64 uh, support. So that means that you don't have to rely on unsafe API <coughs> or using a third-party uh, API. That's something that is finally built in the platform. So it's not a big deal, but it's nice. No. It's not a big deal, but it's nice. Yes, I love no. this one. Absolutely. Streams. Uh, we are talking about streams. Uh, stream is the... There are two big things in Java C8. Lambda expressions. I guess that all of you uh, have heard about that. Who never heard about lambda expressions before? All right. I guess nobody. So, uh, and the, the, the other... The second big thing is, is probably the stream API. There are other big thing, things in uh, Java C8, but the, the other big thing is the stream API. Now, we're not going to, into, into much details in the stream API. What I would just would like to show you is a, a set of patterns to, to build complex stuff in a, in a quite uh, an easy way. Uh, probably the lambda expression are not so hard to, to understand, not so hard to use, not so hard to get uh, used to. Uh, the stream API is, is a bit harder. The patterns are not that complex, not that complicated to, to write, but it is, um, it is harder to, to get it right. I mean, you, you can really do wrong things using the stream API, and, and uh, um, using it in an efficient way is not, is not that easy, in fact. I, I think the, the difficulty is there, is getting, getting to use it uh, uh, by following the right patterns to, to build efficient code. So what it is, basically it's a brand new API. It looks like the collection API, but a stream is really completely different from a collection. The main difference, difference between a stream and a collection is that in a collection there is the data, my data is in the list, or is in the set, or is in the map, whereas the stream does not hold any data. If you have one idea to really remember about streams, is that there is no data in a stream. The stream connects to a source of data, it pulls the data from the source, it processes it, but it does not create, when it, when it doesn't need it, it does not create any kind of intermediate uh, structure that with all the data for me. Thus leading to very memory efficient uh, patterns and very fast pattern too. 
All right, let us see some <coughs> code with the stream API. For instance, let us extract an histogram from some data. I've got a list of people, all right, and I want to create a map. The keys of the map are the city in which those people live, and uh, the, the elements of this map are the, the average of the people living in this city. Very classical kind of data processing a pipeline I want to, to build. In fact, with the Stream API, it is just one line of code. This is one line of code. Well, the first step is to open a stream on this list of people, people that stream. Remember, this, this returns me a new stream object that is empty. Why? Because in a stream, I do not have any data. Second step, I'm filtering that stream, thus keeping only the people older than 20. I'm not interested in the others. So once again, this returns me a new stream object, but in this new stream object, I do not have any data in it. So this is merely a declaration. It's, it's free stuff. And the last step is the collect method. Remember, the same, uh, same method we called to join all the strings together in the previous pattern when we were joining strings. Now, this time, I do, I'm not using the collectors.joining uh, collector, which will uh, decide which kind of structure I'm going to build. I am using the grouping by collector, collectors.grouping by. I have like 45 or 47 method, factory methods in this collectors class, which is uh, very, very handy, very useful <coughs> in the application. And this grouping by, of course, you, when you hear that, you, you're thinking about the SQL grouping by close. Now, it's kind of the same, in the, uh, absolutely. And uh, it, it creates uh, a, map, uh, a map structure. Now, the first uh, argument of this uh, grouping by uh, collector is, in fact, called the key extractor. It will create a key out of the different elements of the stream. So here, the key is the city. It's a method reference, another way of writing lambda expressions. Basically, it extracts the city from the, from the person class. And this grouping by a collector, if I, if I do not pass any second argument, it will in fact create the values as a list of the people that live in those city. Now, I can post-process those values one by one by providing another collector, which is called the downstream collector. This downstream collector may look a little uh, hard to understand. It is a collector that will be further used to process the list of data that are the, the basic values of that, this hash map. And here, the downstream collector I'm using is the averaging double collector that will compute the average as double of the age of the person. The lambda expression, in the form of a method reference, is used to extract the age field of those people. So you can see that th this, is, this is not very hard to read, uh, probably harder to write, in fact. It requires some training to do. But once you've, you've done that, you can write really very, very powerful pattern in a very few lines of code. Uh, this is one line of code, but if you want to read it, you need to, uh, to indent it, of course. So it's still uh, a few, uh, one line of code on, on a few lines of, of source code. Great. I've got other examples of stream. I can create streams on well-known structure. For instance, on the string <coughs> class, I've got this Charles method to build the streams on the different letters of this string. And I can further process it. So for instance, map to object, and I'm going to cast this int stream into a string uh, of characters, then pass the characters to uppercase, print out the result, and it will just print out uh, the hello world, which is nice. Uh, another, another example of a pattern, I have this files.lines uh, uh, factory methods on, the, on this files factory class. It takes a path as a parameter. Path is, is just another uh, model for a file on the file system. And this stream will be, will be composed of all the lines of this text file. Uh, the nice thing is that this stream is auto-closable, so I can use it in a try with resource statement of Java 7. Uh, it means that when I'm leaving this, this uh, try with resource, it will automatically close the stream for me and automatic close, automatically close the underlying buffered reader that is opened uh, on this file. So if I want, for instance, if this file is some kind of log file and I want to check the lines that contain the error and I'm only interested in the first one, I can write this kind of, uh, this kind of pattern. Also very, very easy, very handy. So basically, reading a text file line by line is just now one liner in, uh, in Java 8 We're using the Stream API. Next, next uh, example, I can also write uh, open streams on a regular expression. Uh, we have this pattern uh, class for regular expression in Java. I can compile a pattern just on, on this, uh, on this uh, splitter and split this book, which is hopefully a, a big, big string of characters, 
uh, using using this uh, this uh, splitter, and this will return a stream of uh, of elements, which is the result of the splitting of this huge uh, string of character. Now I could use another pattern which really looks <coughs> the same: stream dot off, and pass book dot split with the, the same character as a separator. Now the first pattern using the, 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 the regular expression is much more efficient than the second one. <coughs> Why so? Because it does not create any kind of intermediate uh, structure. The second pattern will begin by creating an array of all the words of this string of characters, then create a stream on it, whereas the first pattern directly builds the stream on the result of the, of the splitting. It does not create and does not store into memory any kind of intermediate array. So it's much more efficient uh, as far as memory is concerned. And if I want to split a text file into lines and then each line into words, I can use this flat map uh, operation, uh, which is a well-known operation in uh, functional programming, by using this function that will take a string uh, and return a stream of string. This is the pattern to, uh, to split just a line of code like that, which is nice. And if we're talking about this, it's because we are going to use that in a very uh, common use case in Java E, which is the JSON processing. Yeah, let's add some Java E spice uh, <laughs> to this. So in Java E7, we have introduced this new uh, JSON P API. Um, so it's a basically an API that allows you to generate and uh, works on JSON, so streams JSON. So on the right side of the slide, I'm using that API uh, to generate the JSON uh, array, which I have the re uh, representation on the left side of the slide. So I have this contact, which is basically a JSON uh, array. So now I can do uh, those kind of things. So um, this is basically uh, more or less the same example that jo Jose uh, shown earlier. So Contacts, get value as, so that basically means that uh, we now have a list uh, of JSON objects. Uh, from that, uh, we invoke the method streams, so we will have a streams of uh, JSON objects, so basically all our contacts uh, as a JSON objects. Then we can just use the stream API as we are doing in Java C8. So for example, we do a filter, so we only want the female gender in this case. Then we do a map. So we get uh, the name of uh, that uh, female contact, and then we invoke the final uh, operation, so the collectors. And in this case, so we are uh, doing a grouping by. Um, so basically, we are generating a map. The key would be uh, the name of the, well, all the names of those persons, of those female persons. And then collectors counting. So it's yet another uh, downstream coll collectors. And basically, we would count the different names we would have in our females uh, contacts list. So that's something that you can do today using uh, JSON P1.0, so on top of uh, Java EE7. But we can go a bit further. So we can also do uh, stuff like that. So the idea is the same. So I still have my contacts object, which is a JSON array. Uh, get value as, so I have a list of uh, JSON object now, streams, so I have a streams of uh, JSON objects uh, with all my contacts. Then I'm using the stream API, so I'm doing the filter, I'm doing, uh, so my predicate, I still want to have the female gender, I'm doing a map, and then the, the final operation, the terminal operation is a collector, and that's basically a collector that I'm defining defining myself. So for that, we have to specify uh, four functions. So collectors of, then the first function is, um, what is what is the generic In name? Fact, the, yes. the supplier. The, 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 the pattern we showed earlier for, the, for building collect, uh, collectors were directly the use of these collectors uh, factory class. And yep. we used the joining, we used the grouping by, we used the averaging double. And uh, I think that's it. That's it, yeah. There, there are many others. There are like 40 methods in this, in this factory class. But if you're not happy with all those uh, standard uh, collectors provided for you by this collector's factory class, you can also create your own collector. And to do that, you need to provide, uh, uh, in fact, three 
uh, arguments and a fourth one sure, if yeah. you need. The first one, ba basically what a collector do is it gathers, it, it aggregates all the values in a, in a so-called mutable container. Yeah, all this the elements. Mu yeah, that this container. mutable container can be, we, we saw example, this mutable container can be a string builder or a, this, this was joining the string. It can be a, a map. It can also be a list, of course. Yeah. And for the for the averaging doubled, it's just just a number, in fact. So so the first element is to, you need to build that yeah. mutable container. So that, this, this is what it. Yeah, does. that's what we are doing here. So JSON create builder. So basically, we are creating a container that will be able to contain a JSON JSON object. So JSON create builder is part of the JSON P API. Then we need to uh, basically uh, add the different elements uh, in that container. So that's what we are doing in, in with the second function. So that's the accumulator part. Uh, the third one is uh, uh, it, it, the it combiner. Is, it, it, yes, it is used in parallel, in fact. Yeah, if we, if we are going to yeah. use parallel streams, you basically need to tell uh, how to combine the different uh, intermediate result container into a single one. So that's what we are doing in the third line. So builder one, builder two, you are basically adding uh, to builder one, the builder two. So yes. you are basically combining your uh, containers. B basically, if you want to understand things, parallelizing means that you are going to, to split your data in two parts, distribute them on the first core of the processor and on the second core of the processor. Now, all the collector will work, each collector, uh, each collecting process will work in parallel in both cores of the CPUs. So at the end of the day, you'll end up with two partially filled instances of the same kinds of mutable container, here JSON array builder, yeah. and you need to merge them to, to, to create the final result. So this third element is used to, to do this merging, which is here very basic because yeah. it's just an, some kind of add-all method yeah. that is called And this is only if we are using a parallel streams. Yeah. And the last one is called the finisher. So mm. that's something that you might have to do uh, depending on which object you are working on. So in this case, I have my JSON create builder. And if you have been using the JSON API, you know that at the end, you need to invoke the build method on it to actually get a result back. So that's basically what we are doing here. So we invoke the build method on uh, that container. So because what we want to get in return is a JSON uh, array object. So that's what we have here. So that means that once we are doing that, we still have a JSON array object. So we can continue to work uh, using the JSON P API. So that shows that you can combine streams with existing uh, Java EE API. Obviously, we can uh, simplify the code uh, by using method reference. So Which one do you prefer, the previous one or this one? The previous one, the previous one? And, the, and this one? Ah, there are many and, people and, and using. Next question. Yeah. To, to get to that, to, so to string reference, do you have to go first through that, or can you go directly? <laughs> so who's using uh, this approach? So the, the old way, lambdas and so on, to get to that result? Okay, yeah. that's what I'm doing because I still find uh, method reference a bit. It, it needs some, some kind of, uh, some, you, you need to get used to it, really. Yeah. The, the problem is that when you see the method reference here, uh, you see that the, th the, second, uh, the second argument and the third argument are, are, this, are written in the same way. And if you, you can, you can just, and in fact, it doesn't, it does, it's not the same lambda expression. So the compiler uses the, the, the signature of the collectors.off method to check that this method reference matches, in the second case, the accumulator, which is a special type of function, and the second method reference, which is, looks the same, matches another uh, type of function. So in fact, those two uh, lambda expressions are written the same, but they are, they are not the same and they do not do the same. So this is, this is what is confusing, I think. Yep. So when we design API, it, it would have been, I think, um, easier to read if people, instead of uh, creating this add method that sometimes takes another JSON array builder or uh, an element of this JSON array builder, because it's exactly that, uh, they, they could have done the same as the, in the array list, have an add all method just to make the difference between those two method references. So, another approach uh, is this. So it's basically the same example as before. The only dif difference is that we are using collectors, collecting, and then. So we have a way to specify what the finisher uh, has to be in a different way. So you see that I'm, I have this collecting and then method, and then I'm passing a collector with the supplier, the accumulator, and the combiner. And then I need to uh, pass my finisher. So 
that's a different way of doing things. So what the use case for that would be that you can more easily reuse yeah. your collectors. Well, in fact, there are two reasons for this pattern to be there. That in most of the cases, the finisher is just the identity function. So instead of passing an identity function all the time, which would not be that nice, you can just not pass it, and, and the, the API will assume that the fourth argument that you, you didn't specify is just the identity function. Now, if you're using a collector from the collector's class, for instance, of raging double, uh, and you need to add a finisher that is not in the averaging double, the API provides you a way to do that. So you have this collecting and then special collector that takes a collector that you could specify, here we specified it with a collector off, but you could specify it with a collectors dot grouping by, for instance, and add a specific finisher that you need in your application. For instance, if you want to build uh, immutable maps or immutable collections, you could begin by creating your map using the grouping by, and then wrap that into a collecting and then, and pass the uh, collections dot unmodifiable map to build your uh, immutable map. Th this, has, this has been done uh, for that. OK, so this is basically what you can do today uh, with Java E7, the JSON P1.0 API on top of Java C8. Uh, tomorrow, you will be able to do that. So basically, today, you have to build your own JSON collectors. Uh, mm -hmm. It works nice, but uh, you have to write a bit of code. Uh, the plan for JSON P11 that will be part of Java 8 is to add specific JSON collectors. So you won't have to write those collectors. They will be part provided uh, by the API itself. And you would be able to write those kind of uh, things. If you want to learn more, more, more about JSON P API, there is a session in this room right after this one done by uh, Alex and Mite from the JSON P uh, EG. So they will talk about JSON P11. So I encourage you to check that. Parallelism. Can kill you. Yeah. The fact is, parallel. the nice thing is that parallelism can kill you. <laughs> uh, no, it's not that nice, but it's true. Parallelism can really kill you. We already saw in the, in the joining collector that if you, if you go parallel in that, it will completely mess up with the order of your strings, which is most of the time what you do, do not want to do. If you use a, a, a parallelism uh, on the stream API to build HashMap, using the collectors that grouping by, it will work perfectly well and build your hash map much faster. Now, if you're in a JSON stuff and you're pulling your JSON uh, information from some kind of I.O., maybe going parallel will not save you, will not bring any more performances just because uh, your, your computation is bound by I.O. and not by CPU. The problem is that parallelism is built on top of uh, multi-threading. If you keep the clicker, then you need to pass the slides. <laughs> So, should I? <laughs> no, no. Uh, do you want to talk about it? Yes, please. Oh, yes, well, so you're the one who should be talking about that. So. Yeah, so, so right now in Java EC8, whenever you do a parallel operation, so uh, parallel streams, concurrent hash map, and so on, uh, they are based on the common fork join pool that is provided by uh, Java EC. Um, the thing is that the fork join pools, by default, take all the resources, all the CPU resources. So that's clearly something that you need to be aware whenever you are uh, doing that in a Java e application server, because you can easily uh, consume all the resources. So you, ba you can basically kill uh, your Java e uh, application server. So there are some ways to protect you from that. Basically, you need to set the parallelism level uh, like this, using that specific um, system property. Having said that, uh, I would say that if you plan to use uh, parallel streams in uh, your Java e container today, so in a Java e 7 container, uh, you should be aware and check with the provider of that Java e, uh, application server if they are supporting that. Um, for example, WebLogix does not. And there are a very good reason why we don't support that. Um, all, the res all the thread uh, that uh, we are using in the Java e application server are managed threads. So basically, uh, WebLogix knows how to manage those threads. So if you are using JSR236, so concurrency utilities for Java e, which is part of Java e7, if you spawn a new thread, that's a managed thread. So WebLogix has a full visibility on that thread. If you are relying on the, uh, the for join pool, WebLogix, so the, the container will have no visibility on that thread. So things can go wrong very quickly. So my advice, uh, if, you are, if you would like to use parallel streams uh, in your uh, Java e container, first make sure that they are just uh, compute bound, so not IO bound. And 
double check with uh, the provider of, provider of your Java e application server if they do support that. And right now, I'm not sure that any Java 7 uh, application server provider officially support parallel streams uh, today. But obviously, that's something that uh, should be uh, uh, fixed in the future. So for example, there is an RFE on GSR 236 uh, to support uh, the ability to have managed for joint pool. So whenever you use the for joint pool within the Java e context, it would basically be using managed thread. So the container will have visibility on those threads. Yes. What about HTTP sessions and transactions in threads, etc.? If you're using parallel, it's not supported, of course. No. So you shouldn't be doing any kind of uh, operation on your HTTP session or transactional operation in, uh, yeah. if you're going to, to parallel streams. Yes. No. Yeah. So if you really, really want to do it, uh, use it with care and don't do this at home. No, you don't want to do that. Don't do it. All right. The last, last topic of this talk is about completable future. Uh, completable Future is a new API from, uh, from Java 8, once again. It has been made to, uh, to do some uh, asynchronous computing inside the, the JVM. It's, in fact, some kind of extension to the future concept, and it's built on an interface called Completion Stage and on uh, uh, an implementing class called Completable Future. It allows, basically, to uh, chain asynchronous tasks the use case uh, we would like to present to you is a test of uh, asynchronous calls on, in a servlet API, in EGBs, in JAXRS. I think they are one in a WebSocket too? Uh, yes. So basically, the use case is the following. Uh, this is a copy-paste from the Jersey documentation. Jersey is the reference implementation of JAXRS, and it shows uh, a use case for some kind of asynchronous uh, computation. Why, why do they do that? Basically, they have some kind of long operation in the, in the JAX RS call. They do not want this long operation to block uh, the user uh, that should wait for the result. So they just launch it in, an, in another thread, and they use this pattern. Now, new thread, new runnable is really a pattern from Java 1. We can write it in a, in a different way. For instance, this one, pass the the, um, write the runnable as a lambda expression since a runnable has only one abstract method. You can implement it using uh, using a lambda. You see that the the, the, the opening parenthesis here is the is, shows the fact that the lambda does not take any parameter. And then you submit this lambda to the submit method of an executor service, which could be managed, for instance. And then hopefully it will it will be executed in another thread. Now the question is, how can I unit test this code? Because basically, when async get uh, returns, uh, I, most of the time, this runnable element will not have been executed by the executor service. And I do not have any clue when it is going to be executed. So if I want to check in my unit test if the long operation has returned the correct result, if it has been called anyway, and if this result has been properly passed to the resume method of this async response object, I need to use some kind of trick to do that. Basically, what I want to do is to check if the result object is passed to the resume method of this async response object. I need to do that once it has been executed, and by default, I have no clue when it is executed. And I want to do that in a visible way. We're going to talk about that uh, in, in the next slides. How could I do that? Basically, if, if, I, if I was not in an asynchronous world, well, I would probably be using some kind of mock, uh, mock uh, framework, write this kind of code, mock.verify, mock the async response, and verify that the result object has been passed to the resume method of this mocked object. This is very basic uh, mock uh, pattern written in Mockito. There are other mocking frameworks around, and the other pattern uh, may vary, of course. But the thing is, I need to verify this when the run method has been called and when it has been uh, executed. This is where the completion stage, in fact, comes to the rescue. I can use completion state to do that. Now, this is my pattern. I've got this async get method that returns void that is called by JAXRS on the invocation of a special uh, path in my uh, REST uh, service. What I'm going to do is to split this method into two. Why uh, do I want to do that? Because I need to, to, uh, to get, in fact, a completable future object. Now, if I modify the return type of this async get method, since JAXRS has a very bad tendency of converting everything in JSON, 
<laughs> I don't know why, uh, it probably will not work very, very well because a completable future is not the, the kind of object you can easily convert into uh, some kind of JSON array or whatever. No, I tried it, in fact. Yeah, yeah, I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> so it crashes. There are big, big stack traces in the, in the logs of the server, so don't do it. All right, so I just split this method in two, and the second method, instead of calling executor dot submit and pass a runnable, I just modify this pattern in a very easy way. Completable future dot run async, static method from this class, pass the same runnable, exact same runnable, and the executor at the second argument. And it will just work the same. It will execute this runnable in this executor. The nice thing is that call, run async, returns an object. It was not the case. Well, it was the case for, for, the, for the executor. This object was a future. But this object is not a future anymore. It's a completable future. And on this completable future, I have a bunch of methods to run thing, things asynchronously. Basically, on the future object, what I can do is call the get method. This get method will return the object, or return void, that is new, basically, uh, will return once the runnable uh, has finished its execution. But I need to do that in the calling thread, in the firing thread. I cannot do that as a callback. And this is not what I want. It's a blocking call. So, Instead of that, I'm using this completable future, and on this completable future, I have this second method, then run, that will run the past runnable once the first runnable has been executed and completed. So it's just a matter of calling execute a sync, then run, pass a runnable to do the verification. Now, it's not, it's not, I'm not quite done with this pattern. Why? Here I solved my first problem. I've got a runnable that runs asynchronously. Now I can plug some kind of callback after this runnable has run. But what I need to do is since I am writing to my mock in the, the first runnable and verifying that this mock has been probably called in the second one, I want to do that in a visible way. So I do not want, I, I have several solutions to do that. But the simple solution, uh, I think, to do that is to call it in the same thread, to ensure that all the calls are done in the same thread. And I can do that also with a completable future, because I can specify in which executor service everything is run. And this executor service can be a single thread executor service. All right, so the first step of this pattern is I create my mock and create the verification. All these are runnables, so the result and the response are just mock objects. I don't care about them. The trainer will tell me, all right, when response.log operation is called, I do return the result. This is basic mock pattern. Then the verif verification runnable, verify that um, the, resume method, the resume method of the, of the response object has been called with the result object. Fine. And then what I need to do is create the call, async results, execute async, then run the verification and wrap that into a runnable also that I call call and verify. Now the complete patterns becomes very uh, readable, even, even if it's not that easy to write. Just run async trainer that is the training of my mocks in the given executor. Notice that this executor is a single thread executor, so all the computation will take place in the same thread, thus completely solving all kind of visibility, race conditions, issue I could have. Then run the call and verify. This will run the test. So if the test is green, that's nice. Now the problem is that is the test is, is red, and if my long operation really takes too much time to run, I, will, I might run into problem because basically my JUnit test will have threads, will, will spawn threads that, are, that do not finish and that will block the overall test. So since a completable future is also a future, it implements both interfaces, completion stage and future, I can also call a get with some kind of timeout to be sure that uh, the, this thread would complete properly. Now, if, I, if, I, if, my, if my estimation is that this long operation takes like a few milliseconds to execute, if I'm waiting for one second, it will be enough. And if after one second I still do not have the result, I will just uh, throw a timeout exception, just to be sure that the, everything is uh, w One quick remark regarding uh, JAXRS and completable features. So the next version of JAXRS, so JAXRS 2.1, which is being defined right now, uh, one of the ideas they have is to add support uh, for completable feature in the JAXRS client API. 
Yep. So they are working on that right now. So that's something that you can see if you are following the JAXA SEG discussion. Yeah, and it, I think that in Jersey you already have some early works uh, on the on this uh, subject. Yeah. By the basically way, basically the there, idea is to is, use uh, that as a and standardized yeah. based on those implementations. Absolutely, you need really need to want to check the the Jersey implementation if you want to have ideas of what's what's coming on in in, in JAXA RS. And in Java 9, that is Java 89, in five years from now, <laughs> we will have a, a flow class that is already available in the OpenJDK 9 uh, with so-called reactive programming and, and complete support for this kind of operation. Great. So, it's time to wrap up. Um, so, Java SE 8 is not just about Lambda. So. Uh, Today, we've seen some of the features that are provided by Java ICA that you can start uh, in a Java E7 context. And um, I mean, it's just the beginning. There are a lot of things that could be done. Uh, we haven't talked about the collection framework. We have, uh, well, we have talked about the concurrency. That one is a bit tricky in a Java e context uh, today. But uh, we, for example, we haven't discussed about Nashorn, which is part of SCA. That's something in an enterprise context that could make sense. So using JavaScript for doing some specific task and so on. So there are a lot of things that are available today. And I mean, Chances are high that you are already running on top of Java IC8, so it's really a good idea to start to look at how you can leverage some of those features which are uh, available today in, in your runtime, even if you are running uh, in a Java, a new pure Java IE7 context. So, with that, we have a few minutes for questions. So, uh, I think someone asked about the slides. So the slides, uh, I think they are already on slide chair. Uh, somewhat, someone said on Twitter that uh, this presentation is done by Oracle guys. I'm from Oracle, is not so. <laughs> I'm a free man. <laughs> <laughs> I won't comment. This is what I so, talk about um, <laughs> Yeah, we don't have uh, any more questions on man. Twitter. So, yes, please. Yes. Um, I think I missed that this is not usable already. It requires the uh, repeatable annotation, um, annotation of the wrapping annotation. So if you go back to the slide again. The, yeah. the, the, the question is uh, that if you do not have the, this repeatable annotation from Java IC 8, you will not be able to repeat annotation on any element. And yes, this is true. Absolutely. So you need you need. Um, some kind of refactoring of the of the annotation you want to repeat for 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 it to, for this repetition to be to be supported absolutely. Yeah. I think it still returns cars, and then it, it it works the old way. It, it has not changed. Yes. Yeah. The, the question was about the, the, the way Java Reflect works with repeating annotations. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, that's something that they, are, they will do in uh, the update of bin validation using uh, at yeah. repeat annotation. And that's something that will be used in the update of GMS, in GMS 2.1. Any yes. other questions? <coughs> yes. You mean annotations on types? Yeah. How do you check that? You need to write the code yourself. It's it's not checked by default for you. So I need to provide some validator. Yeah, absolutely. You need to write that yourself. It's it's not enforced by the JVM or the APIs or whatever, but it's an inf it's an information you can provide, and take it take it into account in your in your in the code of your application. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, we, we don't hear you, so. Uh, I'm saying it just to change in runtime and that's it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. No more questions? Okay. Okay, that's it. Thanks a lot.
Thank you for your attention.